like to introduce our second keynote today, Hendrik Esser. He is VP Head of Operations and Programs, Ericsson. And he has a belief. He believes in continuously improving the organizational ecosystem to foster high performance. He also served as Head of Portfolio and Technology Management. Today, the title of his keynote is Experiencing a Large Scale Transformation. I'd like to call Hendrik Hesser to please come on stage and deliver his talk. Thank you very much. So, I'm happy to be here. Um, my name is Hendrik Esser. Um, uh, I have a role at Ericsson uh, working in uh, operations, R&D operations. Um, I have more than 20 years of leadership experience uh, ranging from small teams up to organizations that are like the one now, it's 15,000 people in this organization. Ericsson is one of the largest software development companies on the planet. Uh, and we deal with really, really complex uh, software uh, systems. So, uh, and I deliberately use the word complex here. <laughs> they live their own life sometimes. Um, I have also the pleasure to be on a voluntary basis uh, working on uh, for the Agile Alliance. Um, I'm running an initiative that's called uh, Supporting Agile Adoption. That's actually where I met Dave um, also. And that you gave us a lot of inspiration. So, and you will see that in my presentation as well. <laughs> so, um, yeah. What I will talk about is experience a large scale agile transformation. And uh, before we go there, of course, um, I would also like to thank the, the sponsors and partners because without them, I wouldn't be standing here. Thank you. Yeah, so um, apart from telling you the story um, uh, about our agile transformation, which is a unique story, and you will not be able to uh, um, repeat that same story. I will also introduce you to some thinking on how you could maybe approach your agile transformation. So how do you um, uh, work with change in organizations? So I will, uh, looking, uh, I will be looking at um, driving change in companies in general. Um, I will introduce you to a very simple tool that we have developed that helps you applying system thinking when driving the change in your company. And then, of course, the major part will be uh, the example of the agile transformation to exemplify this thing. So um, this is actually um, how we usually approach changes in organizations traditionally. Um, and actually, this picture is from the Ericsson Media Bank. I, I learned that this is uh, Dubai, actually. <laughs> um, very often, we look at our organizations uh, in this kind of way. We uh, see them as architectures. We see um, infrastructure there. If we see things that are ro not running efficient in our organizations, we build new, new roads. Uh, we build new buildings, meaning we are uh, improving the infrastructure by building new departments, uh, reorganizing, uh, trying to improve the flow. This is usually how we uh, traditionally approach uh, changes in companies. But um, there is something missing in this picture. Do you guess what that could be? People? Exactly, because when you zoom in, um, the whole thing looks like this. When you zoom in, then you see a lot of people who are inhabiting this infrastructure, and all these people are doing very different things. In this picture, for example, some, th some people maybe are coming from work, uh, some are going to work, some go shopping, some go to a restaurant, whatever. Um, so it's, it's a huge diversity of people. Uh, another thing you see on this pedestrian crossing is that uh, those people are self-organized. That's scary. I mean, I, I find it kind of funny. Sometimes we have in organizations this discussion about, oh, we need to get our people more self-organized. Uh, this is a joke, in my opinion, because uh, people are already self-organized, and self-organization very often leads to optimization. As you can see here, the, the, the pedestrian areas on this crossing are very crowded, so people start making use of the, the other spaces uh, to cross the street. So the throughput is going up. Yeah. So, yeah, that's the complexity we are dealing with. Uh, trying to, if you now would, would tell every of these persons what this person should do, would that be a successful approach to optimize things? 
Probably not, because I mean, this is an overwhelming task. You cannot tell every single person in your company what to do or what not to do. We have tried in the past by setting individual goals and, and uh, agreeing once a year on what are your tasks and so on, but this doesn't work. So uh, we need to understand complexity. How can we approach this? This is the big question. And um, approaching complexity, fortunately, we had Dave before me, so I don't need to repeat a lot of things. You have heard about the Kinefin framework. Um, you learned that um, complexity is characterized by a couple of uh, things, and that's very low predictability. So whatever happens, um, you can maybe look in hindsight, uh, you can make sense and try to explain why uh, the decision you have taken at that point in time uh, resulted in that and that effect and that and that effect and that maybe can explain to you uh, how you got where you are today. Um, but it wouldn't be possible to predict uh, in, uh, beforehand what is the exact outcome of the action or decision you are taking. Um, so outcomes can't be exactly predicted, they rather emerge out of your system. And um, the successful approach there is experimentation, probe, sense, respond. So, okay, cool, um, we have to experiment. Um, it also tells us that an agile transformation or a transformation of any kind is an emergent change of your company's uh, system. And this system is a complex system because it deals with human beings. Um, the question then is how to change this system. Yeah, okay. How do, how do you uh, identify a suitable system change experiment? So this is about trying things and see whether they work or not. And um, to approach this one, um, we need to understand another uh, thing, and that is the thing about constraints. So um, all societies have constraints, shared rules and constraints, and that's actually what we call civilizations. I mean, those uh, shared rules and constraints, they make big crowds of people live together in peace and uh, uh, prosper together. Um, so there are rules that are saying, and some of these rules are either set or they emerge. So set rules are you have a government, a legislation that tells you it's not okay to kill your neighbor, for example helps a lot when you are living together in big crowds. But there are also these emergent rules, and I don't know how it is for you, but at least in Ericsson, I can see this uh, with the teams. The teams have some unwritten rules how to behave, for example. For example, we have landscape offices, the office etiquette, how, what is acceptable uh, in this landscape office and what not, is really a process of negotiation, but nobody has ever written down these kind of rules, they just emerge. Um, probably you have seen this phenomena uh, in your workplace as well. So okay, um, in a company context now, we set and manage these constraints. So this is our lever that we have uh, to work with changes in, in companies. Um, so what are the constraints uh, that we have in the companies? Um, what are the things we are managing? What do we manage in companies? Any idea? Budgets. Projects? Yes, uh, budget. Budgets? People? Hmm? Yeah? Time? So uh, we, we were discussing what are really the constraints, that the main constraints that we have. And one thing we came also across is that, of course, we manage people, but are people constrained? This is a strange question. <laughs> huh? What is the thing around people that we really manage? Skill and knowledge? Mindset? Yeah. So what we found in our discussions was th there's basically two things that we can try to influence. One thing is behavior, mindset, attitude, those kind of things, because we have feedback processes and feedback is happening all around us uh, all the time. So um, we can give feedback telling people this is an acceptable behavior in our environment and this is a not acceptable behavior in our environment. So we can influence it. Uh, the other thing you can influence is capabilities. So uh, what kind of uh, skills do we have in the organization? Um, and um, yeah, 
what can, and that you can influence by giving people coachings and trainings, by changing the diversity of a team, by adding uh, the right experts to a team or whatever. So another thing that you can influence. Um, so, and then there is processes. Okay, cool, processes, we have done this. <laughs> that is the architectural view I, thought I showed in the beginning. Processes is our uh, cozy corner, so uh, it's maybe okay to work according to certain processes and not okay to work uh, according to certain other processes. And then uh, there is structures. So organizational structures, remuneration structures, whatever kind of structures you can uh, think of. Now there is one, and actually, then it was four and we said four is enough. <laughs> no, uh, actually, um, you can uh, think about uh, more things, but uh, it doesn't add too much. So those four are maybe the main things that we can influence in our organization, and everything else can maybe be sorted in. Um, and we wanted to keep the whole thing as simple as possible. Now, uh, there is an interesting aspect of these four, and that is that they are forming, they're interdependent. They are forming a system of constraints. So, um, an example. We have trouble report management processes in Ericsson, and we have on the structure side certain um, uh, structures that are uh, connected to it. So, for example, the process says, uh, we are classifying our uh, defects, the defects in the software according to uh, severity levels. So we have a priority A, B, C, D scheme. Priority A means you have 24 hours to um, uh, solve the problem. Um, B uh, means 48 hours, uh, C one week. Um, to uh, enforce that process, we have on the structural side a remuneration system uh, which says you get rewarded for answering an A-priority TR in a trouble report in 24 hours. And even worse, with our suppliers, we are very rigid on this. We make this a contract. So now imagine um, a super bad um, A-priority uh, defect is found. The, an engineer looks at the thing and says, oh my god, <laughs> this is impossible to solve in 24 hours. What is the emerging behavior? What do you guess? Yeah. So what I have seen is, oh, I think actually this fault, it's not necessarily in my subsystem. I think it's in the neighboring subsystem. I need to uh, forward this to my colleagues. So <laughs> behavior one, get rid of it. Uh, behavior two I have seen is, um, yeah, uh, well, actually, the guy who has written this defect report, I think you, you were misclassifying it. I think this is a B priority, not an A priority. So energy, instead of fixing the fault, the energy is going into uh, making sure your goal is achieved and you get the money. So this is how those things are, are interconnected. Okay, so... Um, that led to something we call our ecosystem uh, model, uh, ecosystem tool. And um, what, what we do is uh, we take a flip chart or a whiteboard or whatever you like. Um, we put the four constraint domains into the four quadrants. And then, of course, when we want to drive change using these four levers into the organizations, um, we, of course, need to think about change for what? You need to have a goal. So apart from remembering, okay, these things are interconnected, if I tune in one corner, something else might uh, follow, um, uh, we need to also think about what is my desired state? What, where do I want to go? What's the goal of, of my change? You can also use this tool for uh, analyzing a problem, if you like. We have also used it for that kind of purpose. Um, to think a bit deeper, behavior is only the thing that you see above the surface. This is the thing, I've seen this behavior from you and this is maybe a good behavior I like or this is suitable in our environment or not. Below the surface are things like mindset and attitude, values and needs. Those ones you can't see. You can't uh, say, because I see this behavior, this is exactly the mindset of this person. You can speculate on this, but uh, without a conversation or whatever, you will never find it out. Um, but those are still there. Um, by the way, how many of you have company values? So I think 
every good company needs to have company values. So written, one. written ones, yeah. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> and well, thank you for that. <laughs> um, so <laughs> can I go to you and say from tomorrow on what's your value is professionalism? Will that change something? Probably not. <laughs> so, uh, actually, what companies want to ex want to express with these value statements, these written down uh, values, is they are expecting a certain behavior. Mm. Okay, on the capability side, what you see above the surface are things like the competence of people, the skills of people, number of people, diversity of people, things like that, and then uh, you have also below the f uh, surface things like hidden talent. On the process side, above the surface are processes, practices, maybe tools, um, and uh, below the surface are things like habits. I don't know how much below the, the surface this really is. But <laughs> and then structures, um, organization, governance structures, compensation structures, roles are there. And um, they are, of course, below the surface, half below the surface sometimes, these informal structures. And all these things form a system. So um, what you actually do is um, you assemble a diverse team because you want to have uh, insights and perspectives from as many uh, areas in the company uh, that you are dealing with uh, as, as you can. And you go through this. You, you start thinking about, okay, uh, you, you agree on what do you want to achieve then you think about what behaviors would help me uh, to achieve my desired state. And after that, you, you think about, okay, what capabilities uh, would we need to, de to reach our desired state and what capabilities would help us to let the desired behaviors emerge? And then what processes do we need to reach the desired state? What processes would help us to support the capabilities we wanted and what processes would uh, help us to rather let the desired behaviors emerge. And the same with structures. So you, all the time you add something, you think about what are the side effects on, on the other areas. Hmm? Um, a learning is, we started uh, experimenting with this tool something like uh, five years ago and um, in the beginning, when we were trying this with teams, we said, okay, just start anywhere in this scheme. So here's your desired uh, state. Um, figure out what kind of system change you want to drive. Um, people, and we made an observation, people uh, or teams who were starting on the structure process side in our cozy corner, because this is relatively easy. We are used to talk about structures and processes. Those teams' uh, results were really inferior to those teams who were starting with behavior. So at the moment when we are teaching, uh, today when we are teaching this uh, model, we are telling people start with the behavior and then for each of the uh, desired behaviors um, that uh, you want to see, uh, think about um, capabilities, processes and structures. So when you are learning uh, to use this kind of tool, then start with behaviors, strong recommendation. Uh, the reason for that is that uh, behavior is much more emergent than process and structure. Okay, and then you have a learning cycle. Uh, you look at your system, you, at your organization, you, uh, you do an analysis. Is my vision still valid? By the way, this is a very important thing uh, that you need to think, um, is my desired state still the same? This, this can be a moving target and you need to think about this frequently to see Am I still after the, the same thing as a month ago? Um, and then you start thinking about what behavior capabilities, process and structures uh, support my vision and, and what doesn't. And then you define a change experiment or an intervention. Um, you take change actions. You observe what emerges. And one tool that we learned uh, from uh, Agile and from Scrum are retrospectives. And um, sorry, and then uh, you look at the system again and go for the next uh, through the next cycle. 
Good. So far, the theory. Um, now let's go a bit into practice uh, of this thing um, and let's look at the Agile transformation, which started in 2008 um, in our organization. At that time, I was a member of a leadership team of a 2,000 people uh, organization. And um, actually, our business situation was really, really good. So uh, we were selling really, really well. Um, there was only a few problems, like um, our quality was okay, but it could have been better. Um, and our time to market was totally rotten because uh, all our projects were six to 18 months uh, delayed, all of them. But we were earning lots of money with it. So um, from a leadership team perspective, we were arguing, is there really the need for change? I mean, we are making money. But we said, OK, maybe times will not be as good as they are today. Maybe one day the business situation will become tougher. And it became tougher <laughs> as time was showing. And we said, the time for change is maybe now. So we started saying, we need to explore how can we um, look at our problems. So we started to think about an intervention. And what we said is we need to have better customer satisfaction, better quality, and the time to market. Uh, those were the three things that we were mostly after in the beginning. OK, and what I'm telling now is um, actually a story that um, just this first intervention to define that one was a process of one year, activating a lot of people within the organization. But And I, sh I show you the result now. I mean. The first thing was that we said we need to empower the teams. Um, if we want to uh, uh, make that happen, uh, it cannot be the, uh, everything on the leaders only. This command and control structure we had in the past is not fit for purpose for a probably a rapidly changing environment. And we really felt that the industry is changing. The telecommunication industry has been changing a lot in the last uh, eight, nine years. Um, so we need to have empowered teams so they can help us changing direction fast. So uh, if I now go to a team and say from tomorrow onwards you're empowered, job done. No, it's not. You need to think about how can we empower teams uh, by thinking about what can I do uh, to support this, that people really feel empowered and that they have an empowered behavior. So what we said is, on the structure side, one thing we can do is to build cross-functional teams. Because um, if, cross if teams are having the end-to-end -end view on what they are doing, they are much more empowered as a team to do the whole job. So we said, OK, in the past, we had a, a system design department, which is doing the high-level system architecture and the requirement management. We had the development department doing the software implementation, and then a test uh, department doing the testing three silos. And all of them had been looking for the last 10 years before to uh, optimize their processes, and they got stuck. They couldn't see any more improvements. So we said, let's combine them. We um, reorganize, and we put all of these departments together and build true cross-functional teams. Um, then, of course, uh, if we have cross-functional teams um, uh, and we want to empower them. We need to train and coach the teams um, uh, to become able to do the job. And um, we said also when we, one, one key thing here was also that we understood agility is the approach we want to uh, take with Scrum as a process framework. But here Scrum is, Scrum can be misused as a pure process framework if you're not supporting it with things in the other quadrants of the model, right? So um, we said as a process uh, framework, we use Scrum. Scrum comes with a couple of uh, structural elements like Scrum masters and product owner roles, for example. Yeah, wonderful, uh, you could say. Um, uh, then we have the empowered teams, right? Is that enough? Yeah, now we have Scrum, we have Scrum Masters, Scrum, uh, we have the product owners, we have cross-functional teams, we have trained ev everybody, now everybody's empowered. Hmm. If th we said when, when somebody needs to be empowered, somebody else needs to be disempowered. <laughs> <laughs> so the next thing is we t need to talk about the leadership in our organization. Hmm. So um, what we started to think about is what are our expected leadership behaviors? because we need to learn to let go. And we started to define this. 
we started to make a list of expected leadership behaviors fit for purpose for what we were going for. Um, now, if I go to the leaders and say from tomorrow onwards, this is what I expect from you, will this just happen? Probably not. We need to support it from something else. And what we did was recruit the leaders with the right mindset. And this was actually a very scary moment because this was made possible by this reorganization that was caused anyhow uh, by putting all these uh, development de or these departments together. Um, so we said, um, okay, anyhow, not any of the leaders has exactly the same role as before. So all the leadership roles can be advertised and the, all the leaders have, need to have to reapply and other people who think that they are more suitable, they can also apply. The interesting thing is, now the recruitment criteria are different uh, to the recruitment criteria we had before because now uh, we had thought about where are we going and what are expected le leadership behaviors and, and mindset and attitude and so on. I can tell you the leaders were pretty scared <laughs> about this thing. <laughs> okay, so and then uh, we said uh, retrospectives. Okay, oh aren't retrospectives part of Scrum. What we said is we need retrospectives not only in the development teams. If this is an iterative process, we need to have retrospectives also on the leadership team level. Yeah. So in the beginning, we started to ask uh, experienced Scrum coaches um, who are good facilitators of retrospectives to come into our leadership teams and um, uh, uh, do the retrospectives with the leadership team. Then uh, the Agile Manifesto was giving us some ideas about what wanted behaviors uh, we want to see. Um, we also said that uh, from a behavior point of view, we need to have a much better collaboration between development and product management. So Ericsson is a company where product uh, management and product development is in two different organizations also today. That's because we have a global market presence and we need to have a centralized entry point into the organization for new requirements and, and product strategies. And uh, that um, collaboration did not work so well in the past. Um, and we said that this needs to become uh, much, much better. Um, to support the whole thing, and that was a discussion about um, how do we scale Agile I mean, this whole discussion about scaling Agile, for us it was more a question of how um, do we coordinate the work between teams who are working on the same product and uh, how do we manage dependencies and how do we manage uncertainty. So uncertainty management became one of the things. How can you plan in an unpredictable environment? That was actually the essence that we found when we were looking into the question on why are we always six to 18 months delayed with our projects? So uncertainty management uh, basically is a practice we built which is working like this, and this is super simple actually. Um, we said instead of giving a, a one, as we say, precisely wrong estimate, we give two, we give a range. So um, when an expert looks at um, a new requirement, this expert can say from an effort point of view, this is, in the past we would have said this is 1,227 um, technical man hours, which is a precisely wrong estimate. It's precise, but totally wrong. Now we say it's between uh, 500 and 2,500. So the expert can ex uh, express the level of uncertainty. Um, and this person usually has an experience and is able to express this uncertainty in a good way. And the same is something we do with time. So instead of saying we deliver this functionality by uh, 7th of September 9 a.m., which is a precisely wrong estimate as well, we say we deliver this between July and October. Okay. What we also said is we are re-estimating that range after every sprint and that gives us a leading indicator because if after a sprint the range is not shrinking or shifting or it's shifting, then this is a leading indicator that maybe something uh, is different than what we were anticipating and we need to act on that one. Yeah, and that was supported also by a decision model. So when, how do we g take decisions on uh, getting going with a new requirement? Uh, how do we decide that now we are happy to ship this to the customer and so on? 
Uh, we introduced new governance um, structures. We introduced methods for uh, structures for backlog co coordination and so on. So um, now you could say uh, Dave was talking about safe to fail experiments. They should be small and so on. This was by far not a safe to fail experiment. This is a giant experiment because it's a reorganization. It, the, the problem was that our status quo was so far away from where we wanted to be that uh, we only saw that uh, we need to do a bit of a leap of faith. Yet, I have to say that formulating this experiment took us a year. And that year looked like this, that um, the leadership team was forming work groups. Into these work groups, um, we were inviting people from all around the organization. We were saying whoever is passionate about thinking about how could we become better as an organization is, invi is invited. We had at the, at, the, at the end, we had 140 people who were voluntarily working on these things. They were, create, they were starting to create, I think, 500 PowerPoint slides of new process descriptions, <laughs> which was actually, you could say, oh my god, what are they doing? And that's actually where we took the, uh, pulled the break from the leadership team and said, OK, thank you. You're engaged. We love your ideas. But you're not going to prescribe to others uh, how you are going to work. This is a body of knowledge, what you have just created. So those 500 slides are fantastic. And they are great source of inspiration for later on. But OK, let's park them here. And um, the good thing was that this has engaged people. And for example, in the beginning of the whole uh, discussion, we didn't say we want to go agile because we thought that agile can't be scaled to an organization of 2,000 people. I was one of the persons saying this. But then there were people saying, oh, but Scrum, this looks cool. Um, let's, can't we try this out? And some organizations tried it out. And the, those small safe to fail experiments, they resulted in that they said, well, actually, this is working, even for an organization like ours. And people got an idea how to do it. So there were a lot of little safe to fail experiments leading to this giant le leap of faith that I've just uh, shown. So. All good, this is our experiment, story done? No, <laughs> because things changed. And the second intervention was needed because something emerged from the, from the system. So what emerged? So first thing that emerged, that there was full leadership support for the change. Okay, so this whole thing, idea, uh, this whole idea about defining leadership behaviors, mindset and attitude, and recruiting the right people for this worked out. But another thing emerged, teams ignore our committees and architecture quality is endangered. Oops, what's this? <laughs> so um, those of you who are in system architecture um, know that uh, refactoring system architecture is super expensive, right? So you can maybe screw up a subroutine in, in, a, in, a, uh, in a program, but um, Screwing up your system architecture, refactoring that is, is really expensive. And um, to guard the architecture, we had architect architecture committees in the past who were looking at architecture proposals that some people were doing and then uh, giving feedback on how to make it correct. And um, those committees, uh, they were ignored by the teams because the teams learned you're empowered, you're self-contained, everybody can do architecture which is not true. Uh, you are not an architecture ex expert just because uh, by definition. This was an unexpected side effect of the thing. And our, uh, then, when, then we said, OK, um, we need to work on that one. So what do we do? On the structure side, um, we need to reinforce architecture and committee roles. We understood that it's, of course, not good that a, a team maybe works on an architecture proposal for six weeks, goes to the committee, and the committee says, oh, great what you did in the last six weeks, but OK, all wrong. You have to do it like that, that, and that. That's very frustrating, and it's a waste of time. So, um, But yet, I mean, as long as we don't find a more agile or mo better solution, those committees need to be re-empowered. But they need to behave maybe a bit differently. So we said on the behavior side, and we made workshops with these committees, we need to discuss rather a mentoring approach. So be with the teams and help them to develop good architectures from the start. Yeah. The, the problem there was that we didn't have enough people on these committees um, to, uh, to support the teams frequent enough. So that was then one side effect of the thing that we started to, rec uh, to build up more people with uh, this uh, very deep architecture competence. Um, yeah, okay, so that was the second intervention. What happened next? What emerged? 
Um, the next thing that emerged that, um, okay, somewhere somebody said that working software is the only progress indicator. So a couple of clever people uh, thought, oh, documentation uh, is maybe not so, who needs a manual? The working software is the important thing. So um, I've seen this uh, thing emerge in a lot of companies. And um, for us, it meant that documentation was not handled appropriately. And that's, of course, not okay. So uh, what we said is, from a behavior point of view, people need to uh, focus on everything the customer expects, not only code. And uh, that means on a structural side, we need to have higher priority on uh, things that are not code. So we clarified the product owner role to make that happen. What happened next? Oh, collaboration, development, product management is starting to work well. Hmm. How could that happen? So what, what happened actually was that um, this uncertainty management practice in the beginning, it, was, uh, it created a huge debate uh, because uh, the product management was saying, oh, we have committed this functionality to the customer for um, uh, 9th of September, uh, 9 a.m. And you're coming and telling me it's between July and, and October. Oh my God, are you, are you crazy? I want to have a commitment from you in development to d exactly deliver it here. So that was the beginning of the debate, but uh, we were <coughs> going through and through with them uh, on why is this range important? And after them seeing it work, when, for example, they could see, oh, yeah, okay, now the range is really shrinking and we are able to deliver on, on the exact date because this indica early indicator that something is not working uh, helps us to correct our direction. For example, we were throwing out user stories that were not absolutely needed, or um, uh, we were adding teams uh, to a development uh, item um, uh, to speed things up and so on. So this really helped us to stay on course. Hmm. And after seeing this working for a year, our product management was really buying into this one and they were starting to embrace it. So um, this collaboration worked really well. Uh, then another thing unfortunately emerged and that was uh, the teams were starting to diverge. Um, and that was a bit this uh, classical, um, uh, my agile is more agile than your agile <laughs> thing. The agile religious war that we, we see in, in a number of organizations. So, um, and and the, the root cause of that might have been that, uh, okay, the teams were developing their way of working, how the team is working, and um, yeah, the problem is that a lot of teams are working on the same product. And at some point in time, they need to integrate, and when they need to integrate, they need to be aligned in some way, otherwise the integration doesn't work. So um, the end-to-end -end flow was not optimized. So that was the moment when we understood, hey, you, ha you are empowered, but within boundaries. You, there are certain things that everybody has to do exactly the same way. We would like to give you as much freedom as possible, but certain things need to be in boundaries. And uh, what we did was that we were clarifying which processes and tools are mandatory and which ones um, are optional. And also here, very important is that you don't over constrain your system. Really sense what kind of constraints you put here make sense and where you are going too far. For example, for uh, collecting these ranges, we had a bad experience <laughs> because um, in the beginning we said, okay, me, I was running the, what we call portfolio management uh, office. So we were running um, a sort of agile project management office, um, which was collecting and working with these ranges and, and following up on the stuff. And what we said is, okay, oh, we need to collect the ranges. Best thing is we do this with the tools. So we uh, used rational team concert. Uh, we want to use rational team concert uh, for that. So we are, we are asking all teams to use ra rational team concert. And then uh, there was a bit of an uproar in the organization because uh, some those teams who were like feature teams that were consisting of six scrum teams distributed over four locations, um, those teams said, oh, but this is a great tool because it helps us aligning between these different uh, uh, locations and so on, so they liked it. But there were also f uh, feature teams that were consisting only of one Scrum team, and they said, are you completely crazy? This tool, uh, I mean, what this tool is doing, I can do on a whiteboard in front of my office. And you are asking me to 
make all this, uh, set up the tool and maintain this and so on, this is, this is not working for us. So that was one of those moments, for example, where we made the tool optional and just uh, pr uh, said, okay, no matter how you do it, we need ranges from you. And instead of uh, optimizing uh, it for the, the five people in the project management office, making uh, uh, 1,900 people suffer from that, we have said, okay, let's optimize it for 1,900 people and rather add a sixth person to the um, uh, project office to collect the ranges. Yeah, and then another thing we did to optimize the end flow was um, in the decision model, uh, which contains also our de definition of done, uh, we have strengthened the end-to-end -end aspects of the thing. Okay, what happened next? Ah, teams want to be closer to the customers. We take questions later. It's okay. Um, we want to be closer to the customers. Oh, great. So, by the way, this is also something. You cannot force the teams to go get closer to the customer. Just because Agile is also saying uh, teams and customers should collaborate more. Um, if the teams don't want and, and don't see how they are supported with this, uh, then they won't do it in a proper way. So this really came from the teams. Let's be closer to the customer. And we said, okay, if this is now emerging from the system that the, the people want it, then we say, okay, Let's build some structures. We link teams into the communication between the product management and the customer. And um, we have some processes uh, around early customer interaction. And maybe we also have cust early customer demos, for example, as a structural element. Cool. What happened next? Oh. Teams are overcommitted to customers, <laughs> causing a high stress level. Okay, so we brought them into the customer meetings. Um, they are sitting in front of the customer. They are not used to this. The customer explains what the great thing is about a new feature, and the teams are like, yeah, I want to make you happy, and yeah, of course you can have it exactly on this date. So the teams were um, committing something. The problem was that now it was not uh, the product manager they could rave about. Uh, like, oh, this crazy guy, he has committed to a completely impossible deadline, how dare he? Um, uh, now the teams were in, uh, themselves in front of the customer making these crazy commitments. <laughs> yeah. Because of the desire of making the customer happy. So what happened was that now the teams, they could not complain about somebody else who made the, 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 the bad uh, compromises, uh, uh, promises they were um, getting really stressed because they were working days and nights and weekends to make this commitment happen. So what we did is, okay, we need to learn how to make realistic commitments. <laughs> we need to go through this. We need to have workshops and discuss this a bit more and create the capability of doing this. And there's another thing that we are discussing right now and that's expectation management. I mean, um, I always say it's it's, in the past, we had one big bad surprise towards the end of a project. That was when we had the six to 18 months delay. That was about two months before the deadline. Finally, somebody said, this is not going to work. Yeah. And um, uh, in, in the meantime, you, the way we are working with these ranges and so on, uh, we have, I always say, micro bad surprises every week. And those micro bad surprises are so micro that we can manage them so we can find a way forward. Mm. And we can make use of this maybe by also discussing what's the communication aspect around it. How can we manage expectations actively with our customers? Hmm. Yeah, and that story journey continues. It will never end. This is a system. It, uh, things emerge all the time. Uh, you need to be on your toes. Uh, as a leadership team, you need to think about is something significant emerging that needs another intervention? You need to think about are there any constraints that we have that we need to lift now because they are not relevant anymore or whatever. Uh, there of, of course there are results. So um, the interesting thing is the moment we started using the ranges, we started to work in this way, all our releases were on time. Did we deliver them on scope? No, of course not. There's not a miracle happening. But we were able to manage the situation in such a way that both customers, stakeholders, development teams were happy. Um, yeah, then 50% less defects found at the customer after product release. And that was something 
we had three times better quality, ten times better quality initiatives in the years before. They never e really yielded the results that we wanted to have because they were looking in a very mechanistic way uh, on, on achieving things. Here, I think why this worked was simply because teams were cross-functional and we increased the speed of feedback loops. Yeah. So much, much less slipped out to the customer. And then, of course, uh, last but not least, we are taking much better decisions through significantly improved interactions. We have a much better collaboration culture where we have a high frequency in collaboration and, and feedback loops also from a, a planning point of view. And again, it's, it's much less stressful to manage a micro bad surprise than a giant big bad surprise. Yeah, summary. Our organizations are complex system. Your transformation or whatever um, is um, an emergent change of your system. And you need to manage it by running system change experiments, maybe using this tool if it, you find it helpful. Um, because uh, for us, this approach helps us to find fit for purpose, um, potentially fit for purpose uh, approaches to solving our problem and achieve our vision. Thanks. That, that I was once asked um, how, how, what was the iteration cycle. <laughs> there is no cycle because this is emergent. You need to think about how often. In the beginning, we had an intervention cycle of partly one to two weeks. Um, uh, and it slowed really down over time as uh, we went along. In the meantime, we are something like half a year we are doing this. It's usually tied to leadership team retrospectives where we are looking at the organizational system. Yes? With the company of 2000, um, how did you get all the knowledge into these small posts like uh, the, the teams are better collaborating? How did you manage to get the information from all the teams and processes? Uh, how we get the information, for, uh, how we aligning the teams on this new... So how do you figure out what, what, what's going on when you put this into the organization, what comes out, how do you get the information, the output? How do we get the output, the feedback yeah. From, yeah. from the... So that was going via our management hierarchy, actually. So um, we are we having leadership teams on uh, different levels and they see what's going on. They can be in the daily scrums, they observe what's going on and we are... Uh, uh, collecting these um, stories, you could say, or these observations in the leadership teams to see whether we need to intervene. Yes. Uh, it's obvious when you're making estimations of prediction for cost or time, when you are using a range, then the, the, the probability of getting it uh, within that range will be uh, Data and the accuracy will, will improve from when you are doing a, an estimation or prediction as a single point, mm -hmm. estimation and prediction. Uh, so it, it, it improved in your organization because of that range we are working with at the moment. Mm -hmm. But what is the logic behind the range? Because I, I can give a very wide range yes. and it will never uh, fail. Good point. In the beginning, we said to make this safe for people, this estima new estimation technique, we said use whatever range you feel comfortable with. And in the beginning, the ranges were very, very high. Now, after, and the thing is, we are having a feedback loop on these uh, predictions, on these estimations. So we, we say we log what ranges we have estimated, we log how much effort and time it really took. And we take this into a database and we can compare nowadays when we get a new functionality in, uh, a new requirement in, this is maybe comparable to something we did before. It was in that in that range. So we get a rough idea. And uh, the estimations have narrowed a bit down. The thing is, you can do this when you have an organization and a product that is fairly stable. If you're doing this with a completely brand new product, this is not going to work. So you need to, you cannot just copy this thing to into any context, it works in certain contexts. Yeah. Uh,
the other side of your scrum team? A scrum team is between four and eight people. Do you have the diversity of the team, like age and, and uh, the years of experience? We are trying to have as much diversity as we can, uh, yes. And what is the most uh, most characteristic of the scrum team? From the presentation, I understand that it's team heavy. Yeah. So, um, that, okay, that, but that's now more a question about team constellations. Um, this is something, for example, how long do you keep teams together? Uh, for example, what we learned was that uh, keeping teams together for a shoot too short time will lower the product productivity. Keeping them together for a too long time will lower the productivity and the learning as well. So, our um, uh, experience with disrupting teams is about after a year we need to reform communication happens um, par uh, depends on what okay teams scrum teams are always co-located physically co-located feature teams which consist of several scrum teams might be distributed and then the communication goes via visual communication if wherever possible okay i'm <laughs> i'm here so <laughs> we can talk